Welcome to Dream World, home of backyard astronomy. Today we're going to be looking at astrophotography and what's required. Stay tuned, it might be interesting. These are some things we're going to talk about today. Uh, this is a minimum requirement list that's really for deep sky astrophotography. Very important list. We're going to discuss each one of these items today on this video. Okay, that list looks bad, doesn't it? It's not very long. It's, uh, it's just some things that, that needs to be done for an initial setup for doing astrophotography. Now, we're referring to deep sky astrophotography, not necessarily planetary. So, we, we're, we're not going to talk about planetary. This is all deep sky. Now, uh, the first thing you saw on that list uh, was a telescope mounted CCD or a DSLR. Now those are cameras. Uh, if you haven't picked one out, that's fine. If, uh, if you have, then you really need to look at what's coming up here on this one. Now if you haven't looked at that video yet, it's called To Boldly Go. You need to go and look at it. You may even need, if you've already seen it, you may need to go back and review it. Either way, I would make a decision after this particular video and seeing both because this this is a major thing to decide is your setup for astrophotography especially as a beginner you can kick off pretty good in it uh, but then again if, if if you get something that really doesn't work together you're going to have a hard time okay so let's talk about this scope uh, this particular scope is a mead uh, SCT, which is a Smith's Castle Green. Uh, it is fork mounted. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? Now, this is a fork mounted, and I also have it set up on a base. Now, anytime you see me talking about astrophotography with my telescope, this is the one I'm going to be using. So, let's see what's required now to do astrophotography with your telescope now that you've got a camera. Um, First thing that's required is, in any astrophotography is you need an equatorial mount. Okay? Now, an equatorial mount really needs to be mounted on a solid base. Now, that means if I have an equatorial mount that's on a base and it's on a tripod, will that work? Mm, yes, it will. You just have to make some arrangements. Now, if you've got an equatorial mount sitting on a tripod and a tripod is not worth two cents and it wobbles like a bobblehead, it's not very good for uh, astrophotography. You might be able to see a planet on the moon if you're looking at it visually, but I wouldn't I wouldn't waste my time with anything. So you really need an equatorial mount on a solid base or a solid tripod. Well, it just occurred to you that this is a fork mount. And I just told you it needed to be an equatorial mount. That is true. If you have a fork mount, and you're going to probably, on most SETs, will probably have a fork mount. Uh, you can get them with an, uh, already a German equatorial mount. But, if you have a fork mount, it has to be placed on a wedge. Okay, this is a wedge, and this is made for a SCT. Well, uh, this is not quite like the one you see at stores. <laughs> this is homemade. I made this myself. Well, actually, I designed it and had it made by a good friend of mine. But it has all the functions that are required. This wedge will make this fork mount into an equatorial mount. Uh, these are adjustments for the polar. Uh, actually, these are for your latitude. And then you have adjustments here and on the far side for lateral motion. For lamb. Now, there's one in the rear that I can make and jack and jack this up. I can unloosen these and then jack it up. So that's only two directions that you really need to move. You need horizontal and vertical, just like an az azimuth. But you're going to have it on an equatorial mount now, and it's a fork mount mounted on an equatorial mount uh, or a wedge, and it's going to make it into an equatorial mount. That'll make it track like we want it to. So that's the only problem there with a fork mount is you have to convert that to an equatorial mount and that's the way you do it. 
All right, the next thing is uh, we got to make sure now that we've got it on equatorial mount, we got to make sure that we have a tracking mount. Now, what is a tracking mount? Now, a tracking mount only comes on, it, what it really is, is on your tube axis on your telescope, you got, you got motors. So you got to have a motor on each axis. This axis here needs to be driven. And this axis needs to be driven. Now this needs to be this way so that it will follow the rotation of the earth. That's what makes the sky look like it's moving. It's the rotation of the earth. So this takes care of that for us. Now, is that, is that guiding? No, it's not. We'll talk about guiding in a minute. But it, it, does, it, it tracks just like when you turn your power on, your telescope will start moving. It, it'll look. It doesn't matter what's in the crosshairs of your viewfinder or your telescope. It doesn't matter at all. What, when it turns the power on, it will start rotating. It will start driving at a fixed rate. And will continue to do that until you stop it. Or you move into a different position and it will continue your own tracking where it's at. Alright, that being said though, what you need to do in order to make that useful, is it useful? Oh, yes it is. The only, what you got to do is you've got to level you got to make sure your base is level. Not only do you make sure your base is level, but you got to make sure your telescope is polar aligned, or in my case, I, I will polar align this, and drift align. Now, what in the world is all this? Uh, if on this particular scope, this is where I level. These bolts here will jack up and down where I want it. And usually whenever you do this, it, this will be a one-time deal on this permanent scope. I, I will never have to move these again unless this beta starts leaning and I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, polar alignment is done through the alignment here in the base like we just talked about on my wedge. I will do that. And drift line. Drift line is a very complicated thing sometimes it seems like. Uh, in the old days, I used to have to lay on the floor just about looking in the eyepiece and keeping a star inside these double axes so I can track that baby for a full eight minutes to make sure that, and that, and that if it moved outside, I had to come back here and move this here over. Very hard to do, but there are some things today that will make that a lot easier for you. Uh, Drift the line is a unique thing. There are some programs to do it. Now, some of the new scopes, from what I understand, they have GPS on them, so that will make things a little bit easier. And uh, they also use two and three star alignments, so that will help you out. Now, how does that affect you on a tripod? That can be very bad. Now, suppose I had a something on a tripod, and I tried to do all this. That would work you to death. Uh, if you had to do this every day. That will work you to death. What you need to do is some people put wheels on their tripods and they move it out, say, out of their garage down into the driveway. Now, what needs to happen is it needs to sit on a flat surface. Uh, either take it, uh, if your driveway is flat, you're okay, but a lot of driveway slants, so that's going to be a little hard to do. You'll have to adjust your legs quite a bit sometimes to compensate for that. Now, what I would do is I would mount my scope to where it's pointing north, and I would have a spot mounted uh, well, marked out on the driveway, or I have blocks placed in the yard that are level. I, I level them and set my telescope on it every time. You, you need to, and that would save you a lot of setup for leveling. It'll save you up for alignment to the North Pole. Uh, you may not have to do a whole lot of drift aligning every time. You may have to do a lot of it to start with, but once you do this, you won't have to do it as much and it won't be as complicated. It can be aggravating having to do that every time. But those things will allow your telescope to work really good as far as tracking. Okay, the next thing we, we really need is a uh, I would say that we need a go-to scope for a deep sky astrophotography. Some people don't think so, but <clears throat> in my opinion, I think it would, would be great and would help a lot. Now, with a go-to scope, 
uh, on my particular scope, I have, this is a handheld computer for it, and uh, where well, it's a controller that talks to the computer that's in the drive. But if I decide I want to look at, say, M57, I could enter fit M57 in here, and it will move to it. And it should stay right on it and track because of the tracking motors. It should stay right on it. Now, it will also help me find stuff in there. Say there's, there's uh, programs in here that I can activate that will show me what's available tonight. And it will actually walk through the sky showing this is really for visual stuff. But it's also, it also can be helpful for other things uh, when you get going with it. Now, I particularly think that in order to do, in fact this is a must, is a guide scope. A guide scope is required really for any kind of deep sky photography, uh, astrophotography that's over, say, 30 to 45 seconds. Uh, now, a lot of scopes, if you have it on a tripod and you have it fairly lined up, you can get a good ast deep astro astrophotography uh, picture uh, in 30 seconds uh, and 45 seconds if you're pretty close. Now. Once after that, you're going to start getting edge-shaped stars and you're going to get tails. So you can eliminate that with a guide scope. Uh, to me, a guide scope will allow you to go a full minute, uh, five minutes, maybe ten with a guide scope. And then shoot multiple frames. Now we're talking about a ten, five or ten minute exposure for one frame. Now I'm not talking about just four or five frames. Uh, you know, we're talking about some deep stuff. Now you stand here and try to guide this yourself for a full minute or five minutes, you're not going to like that. So a guide scope to me is considered a pretty major requirement for deep sky. Now uh, we, now that we've got all of this going, that we say, <laughs> and it's supposed to be guiding for us, but uh, when we say we went to look at something uh, in our viewfinder, uh, well, it wasn't there. We told it to go there, but it wasn't there. Or maybe it is here, but when we looked in the eyepiece to view it, it wasn't there. Now, this is a problem. Uh, what, what in the world could that be? Well, the thing is, is, since we're talking about visual here for a minute, it tells me that the scope and the viewfinder and the eyepiece are not together. Well, what needs to happen uh, is they need to be aligned with each other. Suppose you were doing a deep sky photo. And you had a camera on this, and it's in the other room on the computer, or it's over here on your uh, iPad sitting over here in the chair somewhere. And so you can't see it unless you go over there and look at it. Well, suppose you put this thing, uh, you say, I'm going to be doing M57. Well, we need something a little bit dark. I can't think of one right off the bat, which really, well, you can't see. Let's just say we picked M57, and we looked in here, and it, it was in this, but it wasn't on our camera. Hmm, something's wrong. That tells me that in the same case that it's misaligned between these two items. Now, suppose we try to do tracking uh, or guiding, auto guiding. That would be a, a pretty good bit of work for this uh, auto guider to try to track up for all this misalignment. So what you really need to do is this. Once you've done the alignment your initial alignment, you need to align your OTA, your viewfinder, and your guide scope if you're going to do any serious deep sky astrophotography. Now, the way you do that is you will put an eyepiece in this uh, holder that with a crosshair and sit this on a tree, uh, put a treetop in there or a telephone pole that's probably 500 yards away or something, and then do the same thing. You'll, in, in the viewfinder, which already has a crosshair in it, and align these two together. And then you can do the guide scope the same way. Then they'll all three be pretty much there. So now when you tell your computer, uh, your telescope to go somewhere, or you move it somewhere and you see it, you have a good idea it's there, because this is what can happen. 
suppose we were going to do something really deep sky. We couldn't see it. We can't even find it with a naked eye. We look in our guide scope and we don't see it. Hmm. How do we know it's there? The, the go-to said it was there. Okay. We look in our camera. It's not there. But we got our guide scope sitting on our guide star. It's already locked in. And as far as we know, it's tracking. Well, there are some things you can do with the program that's capturing your image. As a preview, you can actually do uh, what is called a frame and focus. And we'll do that when we get into uh, uh, to acquisition. We'll look at how to do that. But the point that you need to understand is these three items really need to be aligned to each other because when you go into deep sky work, you may not see it yourself. You may not even see it on the camera initially. So how do you want to know that it's there? Now, I know, I, I know that that was a, a pretty heavy blow to you. It sounded like a whole lot of work. But once you've done that, you won't have to worry about it too much. But another thing that can be a problem when you are actually uh, trying to do visual work with a telescope or even deep sky photography, they're not getting good images. There seems to be something really off. Uh, particularly when you're doing uh, a visual. All telescopes require collimation, except a refractor. Uh, our Newtons, uh, Smith's casting grains, any kind of catadoptic, any of these other than a refractor need to be collimated. Uh, that's an alignment that you do with the primary mirror and the eyepiece. Uh, is it required? <laughs> yes, it is. If you want to see some good images or anything, uh, it's really desired. And, you know, to me, it's a, it's a strong desire, but it's also really a, a requirement. The other thing is focus. Mm. When you remember when you've done all this alignment and you go and you look, look into, into your eyepiece or into your camera and you don't see what you're looking for, the first thing, especially in visual, First thing you do is you start adjusting the focus. Uh, it's a natural thing to do. Adjusting your focus is not going to bring the object back into your, into your eyepiece. It will a little bit if it's if you'll see a glow and you turn it a little bit and it moves a little, but that's not where you align the object into your telescope. Leave you need to leave your focus. Once you find the object and you focus, you need to leave it alone. Uh, so if I have objects and I can't see them, how am I going to focus? Well, the thing I told you with the program, we'll do that when we do acquisition. Another thing that you could do, is you can use a, a, a you can make a, a mask to go on the end of your telescope and uh, you'll see three items in here. And you bring them to a focus by bringing them into one. Here's another one that you can. That, that one is homemade. I made that. This one right here is a is a unique one that's come out, and uh, I bought me one. Doesn't cost very much. A piece of plastic, you just pop it on the end of it. It works pretty good. What it does is it brings an object into focus by it shows uh, a line all the way through, and then two on each end. But what you need to do is when you get them all separated. Uh, we're going to do a video on this. That's how you bring it to a focus. Well, you, I just said, I just said you couldn't see the object. How are you going to do that? Well, the thing is, before I get out there, I will look at a star close by where I think that object's at, and I will put that on it and bring it to a, a focus, and then lock the focus down once I got it focused, and then carry it to my object. And you should be ready to go. Now, don't try to do that over in the east and then swing over to the west. Wherever your object is that you want to photograph, you probably want to do this to a star right in that vicinity. And that will help you with your initial focus. And then when you've got your camera on and you're in uh, uh, looking at your uh, photo, your preview, before you actually start taking, you can actually do what is called the frame and focus that we talk about to fine-tune it. That's 
where we're going to go with that one. So other than that, those are all the levels you need. <laughs> that sounds good, don't it? Okay, we, um, we now got everything lined up and supposedly working. <laughs> and we're happy. All right, next thing we're going to do, we're going to take an image. Now, we've, caught, we've got our image. We spent some uh, hours out here, maybe a couple hours, taking multiple frames. And we intend we're going we're gonna to stack these when we get back in our, in our house. Okay, what needs to be done? Well, you need to make what is called uh, pre-processing frames for calibration. You need to calibrate uh, deep sky stuff. Now, it, when you've done uh, planetary stuff, you pretty much just took the picture because remember they were shot, each frame was less than a second. And say you shot 100 of them or 500 of them, whatever you wanted. It doesn't matter. Each one was less than a second. So you really don't really need calibration frames for planetary pictures. Uh, but when you get into deep sky, in my opinion, anything over one second exposure on a frame is considered long exposure. So anything over one second, or one second and over, needs to be calibrated. So what you have to do is learn to make calibration frames. And we will do a little video on that, how to make calibration frames and then how to use them. But you have to remember now, in deep sky, you do need to come up with calibration frames and be ready to do pre-processing. Pre and that's pre-processing. We'll be doing pre-processing. And then we'll have to do post-processing. Now what is, what's the difference? Pre-processing is the calibration frames. Post-processing is when you take your picture and you want to start and you've stacked them and you've done all this and you want to clean them up. You want to uh, to darken it, clean the background, make it, make, bring out the colors and whatever. That's post-processing. You'll make the image look a whole lot better just by doing post-processing. Now, suppose we did post-processing but we didn't do any pre-processing. You will have problems in there like say on pre-processing frames we'll do darks and we'll do bias and we'll do uh, flats. Now you'll say, well, what is all this we're talking about? You say, we're going to do this later. Well, you need to know what you're going to be doing. If you're not doing uh, dark frames, bias frames, and flats in pre-processing for calibration, then when you go to do post-processing, they're going to still have a lot of problems in them. Now, I'm not going to go into all the problems that you'll have, because we'll cover that in another video. You just need to know that's where we need to go now is uh, to look at now that you're going to have to have program to be able to handle that yeah I know I know I know I told you you got to have programs okay that means that we got to have programs for making uh, capturing our images we're going to capture them and put them they're going to go straight to a laptop Ah, there's a key, a laptop. So we're going to need, in astrophotography, you're going to need a laptop. And the laptop is for gathering our images and keeping track in a library of them, uh, making uh, calibration frames for pre-processing, and post-processing programs. Now, what am I talking about? Your acquisition program that goes with your camera, some of those, for most of them actually, will capture dark frames. Uh, most of them will allow you to use bias frames and flats. Well, there's a uniqueness amongst each one of those that have to be collected. And, we'll, and I'll do a video on that to show you how to, how to make darks, how to make bias, and how to make flats. Uh, but you'll need to store them on the computer. Uh, you'll also want to have a post-processing program. Now, some of your camera programs will have some post-processing available, things like curves or stretch or some things like that, uh, or maybe color balancing. Well, a lot of people like to use uh, Photoshop. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's an old version of Photoshop or a new version. They just, they just add a whole lot more stuff to them, make them even more complicated using the way they were, in my opinion. Uh, I've got... Two of them myself, uh, version 7 and, and a CS2. I love the CS2. 
That's what I would suggest somewhere along there, get something like that. Uh, <coughs> but if you don't want to use, because uh, Photoshop it may be too expensive for you, uh, Paint Shop, uh, uh, I think Paint Shop Pro from Corel, uh, they do a fantastic job for a lot less money, and uh, some of the same features are in, in Paint Shop as they are in Photoshop. So it can also be used. Uh, there are other programs, uh, like say for stacking your pictures, there's a, a Stacker, uh, there's a Registack 6 is one I like to do for planets. If you're doing planetary work and all, Registack 6 does a, quite a good job of, of just stacking those frames and, and there is some little bit of post-processing in it, so, uh, like wavelets and things like that, and you can adjust colors. So any of those things are post-processing programs. And you'll need those to be able to do them now. Now, once you get them done and you fix your picture, you'll want to crop them and, and then make your little library of them. Uh, and save all your old, uh, all your, your pictures that you gather, all your raw uh, TIFFs, uh, BMPs. Uh, I like to use TIFFs, but uh, I'll show you how you can get butter pictures by using TIFFs. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, you'll need quite a bit, sounds like, don't it? But you do need a laptop to be able to bring all this together. You'll need a laptop, like I said, for gathering images, for acquisition, to hold the programs uh, for acquisition, post-processing, pre-processing. And here's one that you remember before I mentioned a planetarium. You will probably want a planetarium, like I said before. Make it a lot easier. Uh, you say, well, you got a go-to scope. Well, go-to scope doesn't show you like a planetarium does. I use a planetarium also. So you need to consider all those that, you, uh, that you're looking at. But number one thing, alignment. Okay, we covered a lot. And uh, there's a lot, there's a lot to be done, but don't let it scare you. It's, it's not, it's not that hard to do. Some of these things will be done one time if you're going to put it on a permanent mount. Some of them will have to be done pretty much every time. But if you're smart about it, you can get this stuff to where it won't be as hard. And every time you do it, it's going to get easier. So eventually you'll get to where it won't be that big a deal. Uh, the important thing is to have fun. Enjoy taking pictures. Enjoy showing them. Did it have to be something that come from the Hubble uh, Space Telescope? No. Uh, <laughs> I would love to be able to take something like that, but you think I'm never going to? I don't think so. But uh, I, I enjoy my pictures. You should enjoy yours. That's going to do it for now. Uh, we will, on some of these items, if you would look down that list, you'll see there's going to be some more videos involving some of those, but they'll be generic on their own. I mean, we won't, we won't have a whole lot like we did today. Uh, if, you, if you like what you did or what you saw today, be sure to click below if you never have. Uh, if you've already clicked below or subscribe, don't do it again. Just let it stay there. But look over to the side of that and see if there's a bell. If that bell has not been hit before, you need to hit it. In order for me to, when I post a video, in order for you to get a notice of it, that bell needs to be hit one time. And from then on, it will give you a notification. If not, uh, you may be a subscribed member, but you'll never get a notification. So you won't see anything unless you happen to go to my site. Okay, so if you like what you saw, click like below and leave a comment. Right on down, you'll find a place to put some comments. If you have any questions, uh, maybe you'll like to see a different kind of video. But like I said, we will be doing some more instructional video, but we're fixing to switch into how to, in the observatory, actually acquisition and processing pictures. So until next time, this is Stan Bone. Clear skies.